So earlier this week, we've had a couple of conversations already about what's been going on down in Folkestone because we got the word through uh, that there had been a move to put asylum seekers who are more or less at the moment are being put up exclusively in hotels up and down the country moving them uh, into army barracks. Now, it seems very clear to me that army barracks are now the new policy for the Home Office. What we don't know yet is whether the Home Office has actually given Serco, the company which is currently looking after all these uh, asylum seekers, whether Serco is involved in this or whether it's a Home Office uh, operation and a Ministry of Defence operation. What we know uh, from Nigel Farage's video that went out last night uh, is that basically the land on which the Napier barracks sit is part of a very large army parcel of land. Some of it's been sold off for houses in the area. Some of it is about to be sold off. Parts of it are still occupied by the army, including a section of the barracks, which are run by uh, the Gurkha Regiment uh, and where Gurkhas still stay. However, uh, last night I watched the video and spoke to Nigel and basically it looks as though uh, it turns out that the local people in that part of the world didn't know about it. The local councillors were not told about it. They have been now. Uh, it turns out that on Monday it's all going to start happening. 400 migrants are going to be moved in. It's not just happening there in Folkestone though. It's happening in Wales. It's happening up in the north of England as well. So we will be putting today questions both to Serco and to the Home Office in which we will be asking is this now new government policy that you're going to move these um, asylum seekers, illegal migrants, out of hotels and into barracks? And if so, are they going to be confined to those barracks or are they going to be allowed uh, to wander about? Uh, the barracks are easily uh, sort of defended, if you like. You can easily uh, make sure that people who are in those barracks don't come out because they could off operate as detention centres. But whether they are, we don't know. But let us talk now to Benjamin Lockland from Migration Watch UK uh, to find out what he makes of it all. Is this a new official development or is it just some more sleight of hand uh, by the Home Office. Benjamin, a very good morning to you. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. It seems to me that this is another kind of development in this story, which, again, we all have to sort of discover by stealth more than by uh, information, by any kind of press release, by any kind of instruction from the Home Office. It seems as though, um, you know, basically Nigel Farage has to uncover all of this stuff as it's happening. Yeah, well, actually, none of this needs to be happening. It's uh, a reaction, I think, from the Home Office to something which is totally unprecedented, which is the result of bad policy decisions they've been making for years on end. So in 2015, they closed Dover Detention Centre, mm. which was a, an enormous facility in Dover where we have the greatest strategic weakness in our border. We are 20 miles from France and the continent as a whole, and that is where everyone wishes to cross. Now, people who want to cross for good reasons, you know, for trade and all the rest of it, they use that, uh, that passage in the Dover Strait for positive things for this country and for the continent. But those who also wish to break our law and come here and abuse our asylum system use it just as much. So getting rid of David Detention Centre has created a vacuum wherein people are now put in hotels and army barracks, not because the government have thought this through and it's because a policy they've decided is a good and positive thing, but because they, they're absolutely panicking, saying, what do we do with all of these people? You know, we've, had, we've got this migrant crisis. Thousands of people are coming in where do we put them yeah. and they just need to find whatever building is suitable so during covid it was hotels because no one was staying in hotels and they were all closed so went, oh, okay that's convenient we've got thousands of people coming in during lockdown who by the way are breaking all of the social distancing laws under the sun to be in those dinghies but that doesn't matter because they're a special class of people who the law doesn't apply to according to this government but if you gather in a park and have a picnic with your friends oh yeah then you're going to get fined then you're going to get the full weight of the law crashing down on you but they go, OK, all of these hotels are closed. All of them are, you know, sitting there waiting. We'll put them there. Ah, but then we, we, we exit lockdown. Hotels begin to reopen. They go, oh, no, now what do we do? Oh, great. We've got an empty army barracks. And it is like musical chairs. Yeah. People are being moved from one place to another. And eventually we're going to run out of places to put them. And then what happens? You know, we have thousands of people who come in. And then what do we do? Well, that's the point. I mean, I'm looking at another story in the papers today about a second flight uh, that was due to leave this country for Spain last night, which was stopped for the second time. Uh, but it only had 18 migrants on it uh, who were going to be sent back to Spain through an agreement already made with Spain, stopped by by these kind of, you know, ambulance chasing human rights lawyers who said, oh, there's a bit of a worry that they might become homeless uh, on the streets of Spain. Well, I'm sorry, that's not really our problem, is it? 
well, yes, but these activist lawyers wouldn't be able to do what they do if the law was strong and prevented against this. But we've got a weak and feeble asylum system, which is totally open to abuse. Yeah. And if it's open to abuse, you better believe there are people out there who will abuse it because uh, there is a lot of money to be made and a lot of careers to be made off the back of this sort of abuse. And there are plenty of people who are engaging in this sort of thing. And it is totally dishonest and wrong. But unless the government cracks down on it, then what do you expect? No, you're exactly right. And, and, and when you look at the numbers, Gary Benjamin, you know, what we do know is that there are hundreds of people coming in on a daily basis. The best we can do is try and deport 18. And we can't even manage to do that. Well, yes, the human traffickers are clearly better at moving people than we are. We mm. can't get more people out of the country than they can bring in in an hour. I mean, the, the sheer scale of their operation is um, it, it puts the government to shame, really, because they are far more sophisticated and capable and competent and willing than our government, which is weak and incompetent and feeble and has absolutely no political will whatsoever to do anything about this total crisis and scandal. But it's not just the government. It's also the opposition. I mean, if you're... Keir Starmer, say you're Keir Starmer, Sir Conrad Keir Starmer. Now you're, and you you're starting are to really, so you're really trying box. to hurt me now, Benjamin. Is that what you're trying to do? <laughs> <laughs> you're leaning over the dispatch box and you have Boris Johnson in your sights. Why would you not opinion him on this? Why would you not point out the fact that he's totally failing to actually do anything to, to, to run the country properly? I, but I, I presume the reason he's not offering any opposition is because he agrees with Boris, mm. because they have the same policies. They have the exact same approach. And if we had a Labour government, we would have the exact same thing going on. So why would people vote for a strong majority for a Conservative Party, which has Labour policies? It's just totally farcical. Yeah, absolutely right. Here's the bottom line as well. Um, they also got elected uh, on, on strengthening uh, immigration law. They also got elected on strengthening law and order and on leaving the European Union. You know, so far, it's one out of three, isn't it? Well, I think the, the unfortunate thing is the Conservative manifesto in 2019, certainly, but in previous years as well, is the moment the, they get the votes in, throw the manifesto in the bin. So it's it, it's just a sort of a document they use to get the votes and they go, OK, great, that's done. And now we'll move on to what we actually want to do. Mm. But, um, you know, at the moment we have a quasi-communist regime which is sitting idly by not only while our borders are being breached, but while our entire culture is being effaced and our civil liberties are being trampled over. So, uh, you know, I, I'm at, at a loss, really, uh, as to how this government calls itself conservative and how we are currently in a system where we have no opposition, we have no alternative, and we are entering very quickly into a one-party state. Well, it's very weird as well, because for the first time, apparently, last night, uh, an injunction was actually brought in uh, to stop the flight from leaving uh, because the lawyers had come up with this wizard wheeze, as they always do. But this time, it was about uh, raising serious issues about the reception centre in Madrid. And until such time as that could be uh, sort of investigated, the flight cannot take off. So that will give these guys about another six months, probably, uh, to hang about in Britain, God knows where, uh, while we can't get rid of them. Well, yes, clearly, when there's a will to do so, there's a lot that can be done legally. So when there's a will to keep people in the country, uh, the lawyers are all out in force, the judges are all out in force, the, the, you know, the, the, the passage of law goes on. And, you know, in the same way with coronavirus legislation, we can pass all of this emergency legislation with, you know, pretty much no problem whatsoever. There's no debate. There's no public consultation. It just goes through and then it's the law. So why can't we do it on our borders as well? Why can't we withdraw from Dublin, the Dublin agreement? And why can't we change the immigration laws to prevent these people from abusing our asylum system? Mm. All of that could be done. The only reason it's not being done is because the government doesn't want to do it. They don't care. I've said before that they're weak. I said that they're incompetent, but I think I might have to revise that. I don't think it's weakness. I don't think it's incompetence. I think it is deliberate complicity. You know, they are they are doing this deliberately. That, that can that's the only conclusion I can reach at this point. Well, the only uh, reason I can see the end. only reason I can see for that to be the case because I don't actually believe that they are politically in favour of people coming to this country illegally and hanging about and working in illegal sort of brothels and in illegal kind of slave operations. But I do think that there is a financial imperative for a lot of people, particularly Circo, the company, who are making an absolute fortune out of this business. And I wonder whether that could be a driving force of some kind. Well, absolutely. There's a huge amount of money behind this. This is a, a, a multinational, multi-million, multi-billion, in fact, pound industry. And uh, a lot of people in 
quite prominent positions are making a lot of money out of this. But I, I, uh, the reason I'm saying it might be deliberate isn't because I think that anyone's gaining anything from it or because they support it. I, you know, I don't know what they would gain from it. I think it's a total scandal and there is absolutely nothing in it which is redeemable and no reason why anyone should support it. But why then are they not doing anything about it? They have an 80 seat majority. They're in a position of power and they could very easily pass emergency legislation as they have been doing mm. so for coronavirus yeah. and as, as, they, as the lawyers have been doing to keep people here. So what's going on? Why are the government not acting? Maybe it's incompetence, but I think at this point you can't say that, they, that it's incompetence because they're so competently doing yeah. a number of other things. It's actually a very good point interests. because because you know what they could be doing, actually? They could use the coronavirus legislation that they've now got in place uh, uh, and the permissions that they've got in place to do something about the migrants without even in, uh, without even having to refer to Parliament in the same way as you've just described. Well, exactly. I mean, we've got uh, we've got all of this stuff that's been rushed through, which curtails ordinary people's civil liberties. Why not use that against people who are not only ordinary people, but in the country illegally in the first place? I mean, you know, a, a lot of people made the joke about the, the dinghies. You know, there's definitely more than six people in the dinghy uh, coming over. So they're already breaking that law, <laughs> apart right. from all of the other laws they break coming into the country. Uh, but it, there's a very serious point there. You know, um, th these people are clearly... A, a threat to public health. You know, you come in from the continent, um, from the Calais camp, which the Guardian reported back in April, they predicted more than half the people in that camp would have coronavirus. Well, if all of these people are coming in and they might have coronavirus, then why can't the government use those powers that they've, they've given themselves over the past uh, couple of months? Why can't they use those powers to get rid of these people uh, without even referring to immigration law. Yeah, well, indeed. And we've also had many uh, instances now of conversations about uh, with yourself and with Nigel Farage as well about, you know, how the Australians managed to win uh, over the uh, the illegal migrants that were coming to Australia and how they stopped them from coming. And we haven't even attempted to do that, it would seem. Well, no, I think um, what I think one of the major issues is that we don't have a proper opposition uh, fundamentally, the government are totally complacent. They know that whatever happens, they're not going to get uh, uh, dislodged from their current position because you have Keir Starmer over the dispatch box who is effectively a paper tiger. He might talk a good game, but can you name one thing he said? Has he got one single memorable quote? No. Has he ever done anything of note? No, never. So the government know that they're in a position where they will never, ever be out of power because people will continue to vote for them no matter what they do, no matter how much they fail, no matter how much they ignore the will of the people. We are sleepwalking into tyranny with this one state system, which is which is emerging from the total lack of opposition. Hmm. What we need at the next election is a real opposition party. We need someone to step up. Maybe it could be Nigel if he would like to do it, but maybe it could be someone else. But we need something proper on the ballot so that people can oppose the government when they fail, so that they can be held to account and so that they have a bit of fire on their tail to actually do the things that are necessary. But at the moment, they are sitting there complacent in uh, in Parliament and in Cabinet and in Number 10 thinking, oh, well, what should we do today? Should we pass some more emergency legislation mm. around coronavirus or should we ban seven people from meeting at a barbecue rather than actually going, oh, maybe we should secure the borders. Maybe we should do all of the basic things right. that the government should do. Well, it makes They're a bit of a mockery. Does it, it makes a bit of a mockery, doesn't it, Benjamin, of having any kind of COVID lockdown of any kind. If people are coming here from a country from which you're supposed to quarantine because they've got such a high rate of coronavirus, even if it was only that, that would be something. Well, one of my friends just came back from uh, Normandy and I was saying to him, you know, he was moaning um, and bewailing this two week lockdown. He has to mm. stay at home. And I said, well, you should have just jumped in a dinghy and then you would have been exempt. From <laughs> I, it. Know. Have, I know. I know. They that's... probably would have. But you, and you wouldn't be sitting at home. You'd be uh, sitting in a four star hotel and you'd be, you know, and uh, you wouldn't have to worry about paying for the dentist because you get that for free and you get your phone bill paid. I mean, <laughs> why did you bother flying? Yeah, that? I know. <laughs> it's really quite remarkable. And, and I mean, we're laughing about it because it is so ludicrous and it is so ridiculous. But yet, as I was saying to Lewis McLeod yesterday, who's going to be on the new spinning image, you know, it's hard to imagine satirizing the kind of satire that is currently going on for real. Yeah, I think at this point it's laugh or cry. Uh, it's so bad that um, you have to laugh because otherwise you'd just be despairing at all at all times. <laughs> it's, the government is totally weak. And there is absolutely nothing being done. to, to And it's a basic thing, the border. 
it's a basic responsibility of government making sure that the borders are secure yeah and we've managed it for a thousand years we you know we, we kept out um uh, napoleon we kept out the spanish armada we even kept out hitler in the 1940s so why can't we keep out a few people in a you know rubber dinghy i know because there's no will to do so it seems hard to believe benjamin great to talk to you once again thank you very much indeed benjamin lockbane uh, have a great weekend not not notwithstanding uh, the despair with which you refer uh, migration watch uk is his organization uh, it is in fact the case that the napier barracks was originally built to actually keep an eye on the english channel to look for a napoleonic invasion that's what it was there to do and now uh, it's housing people who have come here uh, without fear or favour, knowing that they'll be able to get all sorts of uh, help, all sorts of assistance. Uh, and they may even get to live here permanently, despite the fact uh, that they are not actually asylum seekers under the rules set down by the United Nations. It seems remarkable this story is still something that we have to talk about week in, week out on this show. Hardly anybody else will talk about it because it's not thought to be the right thing to do. Well, it is the right thing to do. We are supposed to be two weeks away from another lockdown. And yet there are people coming here from France, which is a country from which you and I would have to quarantine yourselves from. Uh, but they don't, it seems. They don't get tested for COVID. We get told they might get tested for COVID, but we can't get any straight answers out of Serco. Can't get any straight answers out of the Home Office. We will be attempting to get those for you today. Um, and lots more uh, questions and answers as well.